Thank you, John, for this very kind introduction. I'm very pleased and delighted, really, to be back here on this beautiful campus where I spent so many good years. So, and seeing so many friendly faces in the audience is also quite nice. So I, I don't usually have this kind of a, a warm welcome, you know, having friends who have nothing to do with Buddhist studies <laughs> come to listen to your talk is a sign that, you know, you have some friends. All right. Uh, first thing, I, I realize I forgot my paper. It's not a good start. <laughs> uh, well, that's one of the downsides of having so many people in a room. You forget, <laughs> right, uh, what you're supposed to do. It's just supposed to work. And, uh, well, I'll try to uh, catch, to make up for that. So, uh, since this is an immense one's lecture, uh, I thought I would start with uh, a few words about Professor Evan Swens himself, Dr. Evan Swens, although I think he never really graduated from, Stan from Stanford, but anyway. Uh, so, since Walter Evan Swens first introduced the Tibetan Book of the Dead to the Western world, the Bardo Tudel, as uh, its Tibetan title is, has been the object of many translation and commentaries. Interestingly, why, while all commentators have written at length about the journey of the dead, or rather to use a Buddhist term, the intermediary being, during the period between death and rebirth called bardo, few have noted one important feature of that transitional stage. The text describes a series of visions of wrathful deities. The dominant tendency since Carl Jung commented on that text in the 1950s has been to psychologize the bardo. Jung thought that, I quote, the bardo state is equivalent to a deliberately induced psychosis. And he confidently reduced Tibetan gods and spirits to the collective unconscious. Likewise, the German-born Lama Anagarika Govinda, actually Hans Lothar Hoffmann, saw the blood drinking, terrifying deities, <coughs> excuse me, as merely the dynamic aspect of enlightenment. The 1975 translation by Francesca Fremantel and Chogyam Trungpa described the bardo in terms of neurosis, projection, and paranoia. In his 1994 retranslation, my colleague at Columbia, Robert Thurman, writes about the Bardo deities, I quote, the Tibetans regard the nightmare visions as primarily intellectual products. They assign them to the brain chakra, whereas the peaceful deities are assigned to the heart chakra. So you, you have a vision of two types of deities, peaceful and, and wrathful deities. According to the Dalai Lama's preface to Thurman's translation, the wrathful deities represent the mind's active transformation of delusion into pristine cognition. I hesitate to mention uh, the thoroughly modernized and idiosyncratic uh, version published uh, by in 1992 by the Tibetan Lama Sogyal Rinpoche under the title, which I'm sure some of you know, the Tibetan Book of the Living and Dying, scattered with collections from, among others, Montaigne, Voltaire, Bazak, uh, Mozart, Shelley, Wordsworth, Blake, Einstein, and Rilke, and a few others. The book has sold over one million copies. My books won't do that. <laughs> Most recently, Brian Cuevas has tried to return the Bardo Thudel to its proper cultural context. But while he focuses on the soteriological aspect of the Bardo, he hardly mentions the, the wrathful deities. Why indeed waste time on them if they are simply mental representations. For the average Tibetan, however, and indeed for the average Tibetan monk, these deities were very real and not mere figments of their imagination. Like the French aristocrat Madame du Dauphin, who didn't believe in ghosts but was afraid of them, these monks could have said, I don't believe in demons but I'm afraid of them. Or rather, Paraphrasing Kevin Spacey in the film Usual Suspects, well, I believe in the Buddha, and the only thing that scares me is Kaiser Soze. 
the latter being the ruthless Lord Crime he has conjured up to explain a series of crimes to the policeman who is interrogating him. Right, so these gods, these wrathful deities, my claim is that they are very real for most people, if not for a few intellectual, Western and or Tibetan. By repeating that the wrathful deities are embodiments of various forms of consciousness, one loses sight of the fact that the bulk of the Baroque turtle consists in vivid and quite realistic description of well-known demonic beings, such as matrikas, mothers, which are actually ogresses, yoginis and dakinis, all of them, most of them, animal-headed, liger, ti lion, tiger, wolf, fox, vulture, kite, crawl, owl, crow, owl, horse, snake, leopard, weasel, bear, bat, crocodile, orc, dog, deer, and tutti quanti. Right? Just um, name a few. The major, major ex exception to this psychologizing tendency being René de Neboski Vojkovic's monumental work and quickly forgotten work on demons and oracles of Tibet. So the, the authors, or rather discoverers, description of that text, the Bauru of Turtle, a, a, a Tibetan lama named Karma Lingpa, his description of uh, peaceful and wrathful deities reflects the tantric inclination for symmetry. His vision of the Bardo is that of a well-ordered mandala in which wrathful deities are the neat counterpoint of peaceful deities. In reality, needless to say, things are a little more messy. The same ideas can be found in pre-modern Japan and in Japanese esoteric Buddhism. Indeed, most of esoteric or tantric Buddhism from India to Tibet and Japan, far from reflecting the teaching of compassion, as we are usually told, can be seen as an attempt to raise the walls of the mandala citadel against demonic hordes besieging it. In other words, much of Buddhist discourse is a demonology aimed at exorcising various types of evil. The dominant paradigm here is not that of, Bu of the Buddha Shakyamuni in meditation under the Bodhi tree, humiliating the demon King Mara by his quasi-British composure, but that of the cosmic Buddha Vairochana letting his acolyte Vajrapani or Achala do the dirty work by subjug subjugating, that is, trampling and killing the demonic Maheshvara and his consort, uh, the Hindu, actually the Hindu god Shiva, conveniently demonized by the Buddhist. My point here is that, paradoxically enough, the study of Buddhism and Asian religions has neglected what should have been <coughs> one of its key themes, namely the role of the gods and even more so of the demons in Buddhism. A number of factors may explain this paradox. First, there is probably a lingering Durkheimian uh, notion that religion is not primarily about the gods, as you know. No, right? Emil Durkheim famously claimed that you could study a religion without really f focusing on gods, or on God, actually. Second, the often repeated claim that Buddhism is a religion without gods, in spite of all the evidence to the contrary. Third, in the case of Japan, there has been, at least since the so-called Meiji Restoration in 1868, a widespread view that Buddhism and Shinto are the two main Japanese religions, with the gods, or kami, being the province of Shinto. Needless to say, these conceptions are, at best, simplistic, and at worst, utterly misleading. Buddhism is replete with gods and demons of all kinds, and the spectrum of Japanese religion includes much more than some monolithic teachings called Buddhism and Shinto. So tonight, by exami examining a few deities that 
do not fall into the Buddhist or Shinto categories, I will argue that far from being moot deities, they have always been at the living heart of Japanese religion. So in Japan, we find no developed conception, conception of a bardo with animal-headed deities, as in Tibet. Yet Japanese Buddhism recognizes quite a number of animal-headed gods and demons, and more generally, deities who are identified with the animals that serve them as mounts or emissaries. Medieval Japanese religion is often characterized as a two-tiered phenomenon, based on a combinatory model that found its classic expression in the theory of Honji Sui Jaku, trace essences and then traces. According to this model, the Japanese god, the kami, are merely the traces of Indian Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. This model, still widely accepted, is problematic because it takes at face value the ideology of esoteric Buddhism. In particular, the notion of an official pantheon in which Buddhas and Kami are strutting about like in a pavan dance. Pavan dance, right? Uh, this is a French dance, so I don't know if anyone is familiar with that one. Anyway, in what I will call the latent, panthe latent pantheon of Japanese uh, religion, however, it is another type of deities named Kojin, namely wild or raging deities, the equivalent of the Tibetan wrathful deities I just mentioned, who occupy the center stage. These deities are characterized by their ambivalence and their resistance to classification. They are genus-faced demon gods or demons whose nature often encompasses, uh, encompasses both good and evil. Their main, main representative is a god also named Kojin. And that's Kojin here, one of the representatives of Kojin. He is the esoteric Buddhist version of the demon king Mara. He is, as it were, Mara's return with a vengeance. In other words, the name Kojin designates both a specific god and a host of relatively elemental spirits or deities. Thus, we have two basic types of Kojin. The Buddhist Kojin, known as Sambo Kojin, Sambo or Sampo Kojin, Sambo being the three treasures of Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, the Buddhist community, and what I will call here the ethnographic Kojin. Although both are two sides of the same coin, they have unfortunately been studied, if at all, by historians of religion and by ethnographer, ethnographers of folklorists, but in a separately, separate way. So first then the Buddhist Kojin. Let me summarize the reference myth of this Kojin. We are told that Shariputra, one of the Buddha's foremost disciples wants to build a monastery. However, time and again, the monastery is destroyed by calamities. As Shariputra, perplexed, meditates to find the cause of such ill luck, a monstrous eight-faced being appears to him, followed by a horde of demons. He declares that he is called Sambo Kojin, or Vinayaka, or again, Tosanagyo. And he claims to be the elder brother of the Buddha. He adds that he is a demon of obstacles, and that those who do not worship him have to suffer all kinds of calamities. Shariputra, in order to avoid more trouble, should therefore worship him, which he does. So let me summarize again the, the characteristic of Kojin as described in this myth. Kojin is another name for Vinayaka, the Buddhist version of the Hindu god Ganesha, right? Whom you all know, I'm sure. He is a demon, a demon of gods, um, a demon of obstacles. A demon or god of obstacles. As a demon, he calls them, and as a god, he can also level them, again, like Ganesh. 
He has a very large retinue, 94,000 demons, or sometimes 94 billion demons. But actually, the funny thing is that it's always a very specific number, 94,376 or some, some other number like that, which is a little bit weird, but anyway. Um, he claims to be, a very tall claim, right, uh, the elder brother of the Buddha. So he's, he's older, huh? he was born before the Buddha. He's fundamentally ambivalent. He protects those who worship him, the good people, and he harms the other. He is also called, as I just said, Tosa Nagyo, Nagyo, yeah, Tosa Nagyo, actually, o, o Nagyo Tosa, a rather strange name, but as you will see, um, significant one. I'll return to it. He follows people all the time. Like, there's a trope here, like the shadow follows the body. This feature, as we will see, also characterizes the so-called deities born at the same time, kushojin in Japanese, and I will return to those. So first, we have this notion of a demon who eventually grows into a powerful deity, a tutelary deity. As his cult developed, kojin's stature continued to grow, while never entirely shedding, shedding its demon characteristics. While he initially symbolized the so-called three poisons, greed, hatred, and anger, no, sorry, greed, hatred, and ignorance, once transformed into a Buddhist protector, Sambo Kojin, he came to symbolize a non-duality or identity between ignorance and ultimate reality. In other words, he became an emblem of awakening the highest truth of Buddhism. In the ritual text co called Kojin Simon, entitled so Kojin Simon, Kojin claims to be not only a god that controls the de destinies of all beings, but also the primordial Buddha anterior to all time, the fundamentally existing Tathagata, Tathagata being just another name for Buddha. As such, he is called Tathagata Kojin, Nyorai, Ko Nyorai Kojin in Japanese. In another ritual text, Kojin is identified with the cosmic Buddha Vairochana, the central figure of esoteric Buddhism. In the Kojin origin story, Kojin Engi, dated 1315, Kojin becomes a primordial deity present at the origin of the world. It is that antiquity that makes him the elder brother of the Buddha. He manifests himself in the four seas across the world, and more specifically in the three kingdoms in that India, China, and Japan. Thus, Kojin came to be represented under three main forms, as a wrathful demon, or as we saw, uh, as mentioned, as Vinayaka, uh, the, the Buddhist form of, of Ganesha, also named called Shoten or Kangiten, Shoten is saintly deva, Kangiten the deva of bliss. This is the Buddhist version of, yeah, this is Vinayaka. So, I cannot see what I have here. So, as a god of demons or obstacles, yeah, okay, this is what I just mentioned, the very large retinue and so on, so, all right. I'm not used to, to use these little things here, so I forget that I have. Um, all right, we went through that. So the three forms of Kojin, th there, therefore, so the Koji, the demonic form, but which becomes a protector, Sambo Kojin, then the Tathagata Kojin, uh, ultimate Kojin, as, he, uh, as it were, Nyora Kojin, and a third form named Kojima Kojin, based on the vision of a priest from Kojima Temple, a named Shinko. And uh, we will again see this Shinko later on. And this form of Kojima Kojin is what I want to talk about, really. Uh, Kojin as a form, as a variant of the placenta deity, or placenta Kojin. So then, again, the images, so that's Sambo Kojin uh, as a demon. That's Nyorai Kojin, um, represented with his retinue, sitting on a vase. And this is actually, for those of you who are familiar with uh, esoteric Buddhist iconology, this is very similar to representation of the, the Wisdom King Aizen, 
who is also very closely related to Cogin, but I don't have time to really get into this. Uh, but Eisen is often represented in this fashion. Or so, well, this is interesting. It's only part of the image, and you have all these flying lions all over the place. Uh, it's kind of nice, but uh, and that's the third one, Kojima Kojin. A very strange um, representation with this little crown, three-headed crown, three-pointed crown, three-pronged crown uh, uh, with little jewels at the top. This is very, very uh, unusual. Otherwise, the, the rock in the lat remains a number of es uh, esoteric deities like Fudo, Wisdom King Fudo. But again, um, this is not a point for, for me to talk about this tonight. So, so this form of Kojima Kojin, I think, m mediates between the two others and between what I call, therefore, the Buddhist Kojin and the ethnographic Kojin. I'll explain as we go. Then the ethnographic Kojin. Outside of Buddhism, there's another Kojin, which I, I call ethnographic Kojin. While it's not exactly the same, it's not entirely different either. The term Kojin, also read Araburu Kami in ancient Japanese, covers two different meanings. On the one hand, the Chinese character Ko or Hara Ara means uncultivated land and refers to a fearsome, ambiguous power a power that is at the same time marginalized and recognized as the power of the margins. On the other hand, it is related to the semantic paradigm ara or ari, to be, to exist. Hence, it seems to express the notion of real presence. That's for you, Tom. Tom, wake up. <laughs> Heidegger, Herr Agnes. This is where I said I, I would mention Heidegger. This is here. You missed it. Too bad for you. <laughs> In short, ara means wildness, the transcendence or the of the wilderness, mountain or forest, in relation to town or village, of nature in relation to culture. In Western Japan, even today, people fabricate a straw dragon or snake representing kojin, All right, okay. which they take through the fields Uh, and one of the goals of the ritual is to obtain an oracle from the god. Kojin in this part is essentially an agricultural, agricultural deity, a snake or dragon deity. And I'll turn then to the core maybe of my, my presentation, Kojin as a placenta deity. At the crossroad between esoteric Buddhism and local religion, we find this figure of Kojin as a placenta deity the object of a cult centered on the placenta. All right, so this is what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the cult of the placenta, then one specific form of placenta, kojin, then a specific form of the placenta kojin named yuna kojin, and finally, going back to Vinayaka, uh, the elephant-headed god as placenta deity. And this is, all right. You know what it is. Some of you may never have seen that, right? But most of us fathers know. <laughs> All right. In pre-modern Japan, the placenta was perceived not only as a corporeal residue, the afterbirth, but also as a spiritual or even divine entity. The notion that the placenta is a double or twin of the child, and therefore its protecting spirit, is found in many cultures, even in modern, pre-modern Europe, as Professor Apostolides, I'm sure, could tell us, right? Uh, and it explained the ritual precaution with which a placenta was disposed of. It was, therefore, the object of a funeral ritual. At the same time, it was believed to continue from the beyond to protect the child. When it was eaten by birds or dogs, however, it could become a demon of obstacles. It was just perceived as fundamentally ambivalent, as a source of life, yet at the same time a source of defilement. The same ambivalence came to characterize the placenta deity. The relation between the fetal gestation, the placenta, and its deity is described in many sources. To give just one example, oh, okay, before I do this, let me mention, <laughs> 
when those are uh, one little cult that you find again in, 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 uh, in Japan today. Those are ex votos representing fans, folding fans, which are seen as symbol of a placenta. Um, and below them is a little uh, mass of tissue of uh, stuff which is supposed to represent the placenta. It's not a real placenta, of course, but it's, it's representing the placenta. So those are ex voto given by, by uh, uh, mothers, right, who have safely delivered or with, with a prayer usually uh, added to them. All right, then the, the text I was going to mention, the placenta exists throughout the five stages within the womb. Lo located ab above the fetus head, it covers and protects the fetus from the heat and cold and from the, all the poison breath of the mother's body. Owing to it, the five stages of gestation are completed and the child comes out of the womb. During its stay in the womb, it is called placenta deity. As this and other sources make clear, the placenta is none other than the placenta deity, placenta cogin, ena cogin. This deity is a mysterious power that watches over the gestation process and protects the fetus from malevolent forces, although it can itself become one of them when not properly treated. Here's another example. I quote, when it dwells on the top of a fetus head, it is called enagami, placenta deity. When the child comes out of the womb, the god is called Ubugami, birth, childbirth deity. When it dwells in the cemetery near the Po and Shen spirits of the dead, Po and Shen spirit of the dead are, you know, the Chinese, <coughs> Chinese and Japanese believe that we have two kinds of spirits, Po and Shen or Po and Hun spirits, um, <coughs> yin and yang, if you like. And um, anyway, that's, they don't have this conception of the spirit as being one thing, but it's, it's more complicated. So when, after the, 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 the person dies, the, the, the placenta now dwells in the cemetery near the spirits, and it's then called tatemashigami, a name for which I've found no explanation. I found it, a few mentioned of it, but it's not clear what its function was, actually. When you worship it, everything goes well. When you turn your back to it, everything goes wrong. You should therefore know the wondrous, that the wondrous essence of Kojin never departs from you, even for one moment. Huh? Same trope. Never leaves you. Every moment it's there. We'll see this again. We seem to have here the strange case of a deity in utero, in the womb, right? Actually, the deity, deity's function extends well beyond the womb, since it protects the individual, not only during fetal development, but also after birth and well beyond until and after the individual's death. And further again, as you know, in Buddhism, death is not the end, right? So further again, from one rebirth to the next until the final deliverance, the very, very distant nirvana. This placenta deity calls to mind the Roman god Genius, Genius, right? According to the Romans, the god Genius was a deity under whose protection, tutela, everyone lives from the birth onward. Let me mention in this context the, another form of kojin, yuna kojin of raigoin in um, a, sub a branch temple of Senyuji Temple in Kyoto. I was lucky enough to see this statue, which uh, not, not so many people have seen really uh, until recently, and I had to argue for days on end with the, the priest before seeing it. And at first I could only see it in the dark and you could hardly see anything. Fortunately, recently the, the Kyoto Museum has come to, to make a, an inquiry about this and they have taken, they have put lights in the room and, and they have uh, yeah, made a, a, a photo which you can then zoom in and see a lot of interesting things. So I mentioned the Kojima Kojin before and, and so as you can see, those are, uh, they are kind of similar in a way, and they both have this little, strange little hat. So I think this is a form, Komijima Kojin is also a form of the Ena placenta. Here, the name Yuna is clearly a reference to Ena, Ena meaning placenta, right? So it's really a form of placenta uh, Kojin. The beautiful statue what is dated to the, has been therefore recently dated to the Kamakura period, 12th to, uh, late 12th to beginning of the 14th century. It's also unique in style. 
although its origins are obscure, it is said to be the oldest Kojin statue uh, image of Japan. The god, as you can see, is dressed in a lavish Chinese robe adorned with floral motifs and he holds ritual implements in his four hands. Now the interesting thing that no one, that's one cl my claim to glory here maybe, no one before me had noticed because they had no image of that, right, is, is the, the, uh, the uh, belly plate. On this belly plate um, that covers his belly, right, we have, we can see, uh, I don't know if you can see, but two uh, half naked um, youth, right, one playing the flute and the other apparently drawing a bow. Well, I've never seen, and I've been asking a few of my uh, friends, art historians, never seen anything like that, really. Uh, so no one knows what it is about. Um, but one of my, so I have no clue as to their meaning, but they could be a reference to the, so the gods born at the same, the spirit born at the same time, um, which I will be talking about now. Um, two spirits that are often associated or identified with the placenta deity. But before I turn to the spirits, let me say a few words about a specific manifestation of a placenta deity as Vinayaka, the elephant-headed form of Kojin that I mentioned earlier. Uh. All right, so in the Kojin Simon, I mentioned earlier, when Shariputra, the Buddha's disciple, confronts a demon who has been preventing the construction of the Jetavana monastery, the latter declares that, declares that he is a childbirth deity in the womb, the placenta Kojin at the time of birth, the earth deity after birth, and above all, the Buddha anterior to the three periods of human life to the three times. So again, one of these large, um, interesting description in which we have a deity whose uh, nature or function uh, changes uh, together with the, the, the stage of human life, as it were. The same description reappears in several texts that present Shoten or Vinayaka or Kangiten, as it is known, as the demons who follow beings like the shadow follows the body. So this is the Kangiten mandala with, uh, at the center, where well, we have the four directional Vinayakas, and at the center we have, again, uh, Vinayaka and his consort, Senayaka, and we are told that Senayaka is actually a form of the Bodhisattva Kannon, Avalokiteshvara, who took this form in order to tame him, to tell him to clean up his act or else. I mean, you know, uh, she looks like this very pretty uh, elephant-headed yeah, uh, female. And of course, when he falls in love with her, she tells him, okay, you want me, but you have to really amend your ways, right? If you want to. So that's the idea. We have this sexual union. They are usually represented, not here, but in sexual embrace. Um, and they've become worshipped in, in Japan as a god of love, right? And, and, and you are often statues of Kangiten would be put in, in the bedroom of people, right, in order to help with procreation. So there is clearly the procreative aspect there, the, uh, quite important. According to an early 14th century ritual compendium, I quote, when the child dwells inside uh, when, she, in, when a child yeah, is inside the womb, Shoten becomes, Shoten, so Vinayaka, right, becomes the placenta. When he comes out of the womb, Shoten is the hood, well, the hood or the, the call maybe, right? When he becomes a Buddha, Shoten is the heavenly canopy, Tengai, which is used in Buddhist rituals. From the moment of conception to that, the very distant moment of Buddhahood, one is never far from Shoten. Again, Shoten never leaves us for one moment. Throughout this life and, and all the further, the further lives. One of the four directional Vinayakas I just uh, showed, found in the Kangiten Mandala, holds a parasol. And we are told that this parasol means that it covers and protects all beings, like a placenta. 
The motif of the parasoli is related to that of the heavenly canopy, Tengai, which occupies a central place in Buddhist rituals. Parasol and canopy can be seen as metaphors for the placenta and its protecting deity. In other words, the womb is a microcosm and the placenta deity is also the cosmic deity that rules over the universe. Vinayaka also appears as a placenta deity in the Shinko Musoki, a record of dreams attributed to Shinko, the scholar monk I mentioned earlier as the creator of the Kojima Kojin. The text describes the union of the male and female principles, yin and yang, through the fusion of the two drops, red and white drops, that is male and female essence, semen and blood. That's the way uh, esoteric Buddhists saw the conception. Two blood, red and white, representing um, semen and blood. That fusion results in the conception of a new being formed of five elements. Oh, sorry. Uh, all right. Five elements, uh, the earth, uh, water, fire, etc. And therefore describe, so the, the new being, because it's made of five elements, is, de is described symbolically as um, a five-tiered stupa or grave marker, right? That's the way you see all these stupas in Japan, as graves. In Shinko's drawing, based on one of his visions, and above a five-tiered stupa, as you see here, are two vinayakas, right? You see them, male and female represent as two elephant heads, therefore, with only the body's skin. The skins form a kind of placenta covering the fetus, the, that is, the stupa. The two vinayakas, who correspond to the dual body kangiten, I just showed, the deva of bliss, are described, again, as the hun and po spirits, the two souls of every being, right? The po spirit on the right, hun, and Po. The Po spirit on the right is, here, is called Buddha body. Buddha body. And it is said to correspond uh, 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 to the uh, body of the individual. Uh, the one on the below is the body of the individual. The Hun spirit on the left. correspond to the placenta, Ena, here, right? Or placenta deity. These souls are sometimes identified with the spirits born at the same time. Again, the Kushojin I will uh, mention soon. The caption say, says, right, uh, it's over there. These devas, no, actually it's not there. <laughs> All right. Okay, another a caption that I didn't uh, record here, says, this deva correspond to the placenta, this is why it is identical with Shoten. This is a rather strange document, but it confirms that Vinayaka was perceived in medieval Japan as a form of the placenta deity, that is, as a god governing human destiny. I believe that in his function as placenta deity, Kojin or Vinayaka articulates the esoteric Buddhist discourse with ethnographic discourse, or rather that at the level of representation and practices, no, no mediation was needed actually, as the two spheres, Buddhist and ethnographic, were never actually separated. Another of Kojin, Kojin's names, as we may recall from uh, his encounter with Shariputra, was Tosanagyo. In various sources, Tosa and Nagyo are, are described as spirits or deities born at the same time. Kushojin or Doshojin. That is, at the same time as the individual. You. You better pay attention. When Tosa Nagyo is another name of Kojin, it designates a single deity. Whereas when it refers to the Kushojin, it seems to refer to two different deities. But the duplex nature of Kojin is implicit in the fact that his alter ego, Vinayaka, is also represented, as we saw, in the form of a dual-bodied deva of bliss, Kangiten. 
So two left-handed deities, as you remember, one being in sexual embrace, one being a demon, the other a bodhisattva, canon. Who are said, precisely, to have been born at the same time. So throughout Asia, we find beliefs in deities controlling human destiny, from the time of conception to that of death, and even beyond, in the intermediary realm between death and rebirth, the Tibetan bardo I mentioned, I began with. Among them are spirits born at the same time, Kushojin, who are said to follow us throughout life, and after our deaths will stand as witnesses when we meet the infernal judge, Yama, King Yama. These spirits are a kind of doppelgangers who dwell above or on the shoulders of the individual. The fact that this belief is really, was really very widespread, uh, not only in Japan, but throughout Asia. I remember a few years ago, at the, I think at the Cannes Festival, there was a, a, a Khazar uh, movie, Khazar or something, yeah, one of the Central Asian places. We got, a pri we got an award, and the, 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 the title of the, the, the film was The Angel on My Left Shoulder, something like that. And that, of course, takes right away back to Tintin and, and Milu, <laughs> Angel and Demon. You all are Snow, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm talking to a French audience now. Yeah, Snow White, Snow White, not Snow White, Snow. Whitey, Whitey, Snowy, I, I knew I was close. Snowy and Tintin, right? So Snowy at one point is, is att he attracted to a bottle of, 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 of uh, whiskey, right? And he has these two demons hovering over him and one telling him, yeah, go for it, the demon, right? And the other is an angel, no, the white, you know, white uh, Snowy, no, don't do it, right? So basically, well, this is a very, uh, very widespread idea you find in many Christian images, of course, this notion of uh, these two spirits. Um, but the Buddhist take is a little bit different then, so let me uh, go back to that. So although these two spirits were originally neutral, merely reporting on the good and evil deeds of people, they eventually polarized into a good and an evil spirit, the latter inciting people to commit evil. Their prototype notion the prototype can be traced back to the couple formed by the Indian Deva, Yama, whose name actually means twin, and his sister Yami, so Yama, Yami, right? The two kings of, uh, of hell. They appear in, in many Buddhist texts, like, uh, for instance, the Flower Garland Sutra, Avatamsaka Sutra, a major Mahayana scripture. Another Locus Classicus is a commentary on the Sutra of Infinite Light, According to which, oh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, where is it now? I lost it. I'm not really, I'm really not good with these things. But anyway, all right, uh, let me read it. Uh, I quote, all beings have each, each have spirits called Tongsheng, same birth, and Tongming, same name. Tongsheng is a female spirit who stands on or above the right shoulder of the individual and recor records his or her evil deeds. Tung Ming is a male spirit who stands on or above the left shoulder of the individual and records his or her good deeds. Six times each month, the four heavenly kings copy their registers and report to the great king Yama. So this is Yama, King Yama. This is Emmaten Mandala, king, the mandala of, of Yama, the Deva Yama. Is he called either a Deva or, a, or king? In China, he become more uh, often called king. And around him, you have various uh, deities. And here is like elephant head deities. This is Vinayaka right here. And uh, above, you have, uh, you have also Dakinis and um, all kinds of rather unfriendly uh, spirits, should I say. He's usually riding, often riding a, a, a green buffalo. And he holds a staff, a scepter, with a little... Um, head, talking head, usually one or two of them. And when they are, they are clearly the same deities, spirits, the Kushojin. Uh, I'll show you some other images in, in a minute. Uh, well, but here you have also the same uh, Kushojin, 
the speeds born at the same time, together with two other deities called Summing, the controller of, of life, and Salu, the controller of registers. And they are duplicates, really, these two pairs. They do the same thing. One, one is recording uh, the deeds of the, of the uh, living, right? And the other is uh, reading them um, to the King Yama, standing above. So, Summing and Salu are another pair functionally similar to the so-called date spirits born at the same time. Uh, Summing and Solu, or in Japanese Shimei and Shiroku, uh, is one of these pairs, and is another one called the Lads of Good and Evil. All are represented holding a brush and a sheet of paper on which they record the deeds of people. Um, so here's Yama with his staff. He's a uh, Suming or Shimei, right? The controller of life. <coughs> Solu. So they are part of the, yeah, of the so-called uh, Ten Kings of Hell. Um, and here is actually an interesting one. I didn't have a better image to show, but anyway, that's uh, the Kush. It's, it's uh, uh, the caption say Kushojin. Huh? Um, not here, but part you don't see actually say Kushojin. But actually, this Kushojin, this deity born at the same time, holds also, like Yama, a little scepter with this two talking head, right? And usually, so one of these heads look like a demon and the other look like a bodhisattva, right? One reports the evil deeds and the other reports the good deeds. Uh, and here's another, uh, this is what I was. If you have seen the poster of my talk, this is what actually I was going to talk about. Uh, the, the god, the Myoken, the god of a pole star, the Bodhisattva Myoken, uh, who is also seen as one of these uh, gods of destiny, and he himself holds, uh, holds uh, the sun and the moon in his hands, but he also uh, holds a brush and a register. So he, 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 his, his name means wondrous vision, so this kind of panoptical notion that he sees everything we do and records everything we do and will judge us when we die. And he has also these two acolytes and only one of them here has a brush and, and the register, but sometimes they both have it. Yeah, yeah he's another one of his acolytes again with now the demonic uh, with snakes above his head. Seven snakes, I suppose, representing the seven stars of the Great Deeper, Big Bear, because he's the deity of the Great Deeper and the Pole Star. So with the Koshojin and the counterparts, or duplicates, we have shifted from the register of protection, represented by the placenta deity, to that of punishment. The two aspects, protection and punishment, can also be seen as reflecting the ambivalence of the Janus-faced Kojin. Let me try to recapitulate. The initial ambivalence toward the placenta became the moral ambivalence of the god Kojin who appears as a peaceful Buddha to virtuous people and as a wrathful demon to evil people. Eventually, the placenta deity as a doppelganger of the child became himself double. His ambivalence was displayed iconographically as he came to be linked with uh, the twin-like Kushojin, spirits born at the same time, as an individual. These invisible spirits, the silent witnesses of all our acts, are closer to ourselves than we ourselves are. But they are not always friendly. They can harm us through their eagerness in reporting our misdeeds. And as we've seen, they can actually incite us to commit evil. The formal structure of the Kushojin pair, formed by a demon and a bodhisattva-like figure, symbolize the two aspects of the god Kojin. These companion spirits eventually became identical with the individual they followed. They were sometimes identified with the storehouse consciousness, alaya vijnana, uh, one, one of conception of the in, in, in Yogacara Buddhism, epistemological Buddhism, if you like, it's a fun fundamental consciousness that keeps an imprint of all our past actions. The twin figures of Kojin and of the Kushojin allow us to reevaluate the polytheistic nature of Japanese religion before it became polarized into Buddhism and Shinto, and to imagine a counter history that would bring back to light the forgotten and or silence tradition. As medieval gods found their way 
into the new urban culture of the Edo period, after the 16th century, often in a tame form like that of the seven gods of fortune, which, with which you may be familiar, they lost their ambivalence. Everything now seemed to fall into place. The Buddhas on one side, the Kami on the other, and nothing in between. A sterile no man's land or no god's land. Deities on both sides of that new divide lost their core characteristics, becoming increasingly benign and lifeless. Kojin himself reformed, becoming, to a point, a moral god. Still too ambivalent, however, to remain one of the stars in the firmament of the increasingly moralizing teaching called Buddhism. Exit Kojin enters the benign, compassionate Bodhisattva Jizo, protector of children. In the process, however, the modern Japanese have forgotten that Jizo is just another mask of the placenta deity once called Kojin. Jizo is not that, this is Jizo, as you can see, and this is face, right behind his face is another face. It's said to be the face of a Buddha, but I would claim here that's the face of Kojin. Thank you. <laughs>